All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you. Um, my name is Christopher Lauer. I'm a professor for EBS Computing here at the Computing Science Department. And this semester, um, the idea is that I'm going to teach you programming in C++. Um, and this is probably already known to you. I think more, many of you have already seen the Moodle website because there were some people already on the slide deck I saw. That is very good. That means you're all prepared. And you've seen probably that we start at 8.30 each Thursday. Um, not at 8, that is a little bit too early. Right, so the contents that we'll see are those of a very basic C++ introduction to programming course. So we'll see things that you might have already heard about if you're coming from a technical domain or if in high school you had already computer science. However, I promise you this will be slightly different nonetheless. So in this course you will learn the basics of C++ programming. We do two hours per week lecture. Actually, it's one and a half hour if you calculate it. We start at 8.30. And two hours per, uh, per week uh, lab course, which is tomorrow at exactly the same time. And also that we start at 8.30. So it's really one and a half hours. But we therefore expect you at least two hours per week to dedicate to this course as in, in terms of homework. This is one of those courses where you can't study after the semester. You know, we're doing the studying while we're going along. That is a nice thing. During all these next 15 weeks, you will be learning how to program bit by bit. Initially at a very high tempo, I can promise you this, this will be a little bit demanding perhaps at first, but since we're going to do repetitively programming, 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 not just showing slides, showing slides, showing slides, you will probably learn how to program by week five. And then we're going to specify what object-oriented pro programming is afterwards. Okay, so that's, that's the idea here. Ideally, you do all the work by yourself. Uh, that means you yourself have to do things not, you can of course work in groups. You know, you will see this tomorrow, people do now and then cluster um, together, solve things together, but make sure that you understand everything by yourself. Because in the end, at the exam, it will be just you, a piece of paper, and a programming assignment. Nothing else, okay? So you have to do this by yourself. We, of course, and with me, I don't mean me as a royal we, but me together with uh, three tutors this semester, will help you with that. Um, and make sure that you ask us for help each and every time you need help. Um, so this is basically the, the Moodle link. You probably have seen it because that's how you get to these slides. Um, if not, you know, basically register, enroll yourself in the Moodle website for this course, and then you'll see things appearing uh, week by week as we go on. Um, the slide set is uh, a, a living organism. I will keep on updating it again and again and again, so it's not like a PowerPoint deck where uh, you just download it once and then you have everything. Week by week, I also add things as I see mistakes by myself or as I um, see that we're going too fast somewhere or too slow somewhere else. Now, as I said, we're going to learn C++ by doing, meaning we're not going to see too much theory or too many concepts. We're going to just show you how to program. And by doing this repetitively, you'll probably see at least 100 programs being programmed in the course here. And by doing this and seeing this repetitively, you're in the best possible way prepared for the exam at the end. And that is just uh, a little hoop. Basically, we want you to become excellent programmers. The world as it is has already so many problems. What we definitely don't need is bad programmers at this point. So we want you to become expert in, experts in C++. And because this is just a small course, we will see only the very, very essence of C++. You will see that in the next couple of slides. Now, through my history, I've seen loads of people teaching such courses. Um, and many of the contents that you will see here are taken from some of my colleagues. So uh, my colleague Hannah Bast at University of Freiburg and my colleague Ron Wiesmuller here at Siegen um, had substantial input in these slides. Right, and that is always extra material, of course. There's so many introduction to programming courses online. Um, there are some good links that I've seen, but there's a lot of bad links as well. If, however, you've seen one and you think this is actually something that is really cool to get even more exercises, for instance, 
for people, then let us know. We're always interested in what is out there. Another interesting thing that usually people have lots of questions about is where will my grade come from? Well, half of it is from your exercises during the semester. Half of it is from the exam at the end of the semester. As I said, the exam in the end is just you on a piece of paper. There is nothing that is helping you. You can um, bring one A4 side that is double-sided written um, or one page uh, A4 as a help. Uh, but typically experience shows you that writing that A4 page is uh, even more helpful than having that next to you during the exam. Very important is with every exam here at the university, bring your IDs and bring a pen. Pencils are not allowed. It needs to be ink that is very hard to erase. Um, and that is distinguishable with uh, um, our ink, you know, which is usually uh, green or red. And what you will see at the exam is exactly what you will see during the semester. So you will get programming exercises. We will ask you to program something, typically, and you'll have to do that, that, that programming task. And there are several of those, typically, as well. Now, from experience, if you never attend the lectures, <laughs> then you are usually in a problem. Um, it's very hard to, to learn this by looking at the slides. As I said, it's the actual programming I will be doing during this lecture that is going to be the most helpful, hopefully, to you. Typically, also, if you've already seen a course in this direction, you might be slightly misaligned with this course. With this course, we see the essence of C++. And if you then start, or if you have learned other things, like particular libraries, for instance, or particular other things, then you might have missed several crucial things. And that's something we don't want. Um, that's why it's quite important to keep on coming to the lectures. We're at the university, it's not mandatory, but I would still advise you to do this. The same for the exercise sessions. This exercise session is where you get help, where the tutors show you how to do things, but also you get the exercises, sometimes live, um, exactly the way they are at the exam at the end. So this is something we'll do every other week, starting from in two weeks. We'll also do a pen and paper exercise on the Fridays. So basically you will get, just like at the exam, an assignment and you'll have to solve that assignment. And then during that exercise, there's no allowing of talking. It is a little bit like the exam. And then for this one exercise that you will do, you will get then also points that uh, attribute to your exercise. That should be the best preparation possible for you being able to program on paper. No help from an IDE or a debugger or nice watch uh, functionalities or auto-completion or co-pilot. No, it's just you and uh, the piece of paper, right? During the exercises, you have to also solve, uh, in the other weeks, things in your own time. And of course, also for that, you don't have to come to the exercises. You have to submit it on our server. Actually, while you're programming on our server, the code is already being generated. And of course, you can sit next to each other and copy from each other, but also that is not to your advantage. Make sure that you don't copy. We have plagiarism checks in place. Um, it is usually very easy to spot, but also it doesn't help you. It's quite naughty. All right. So the essence of programming, and I'm sure so most of you already know this, is that you're trying to solve a problem that is easy to solve with a computer. And for that, there's several steps that are really important. And the first part is that you get some ideas to solve a certain problem. Um, and this is typically this uh, block over here where you need to be able to specify the problem, either mathematically or with some other uh, techniques and methods. Um, you can devise an algorithm. And once you have that, you can start thinking about programming this method. And then programming is basically making sure that this is really, really well specified so that even a computer cannot make a mistake there in interpreting what you want to do. And that is really the art of programming. Once you have created that program, it's being compiled by another program. It basically takes your readable program codes and compiles it into machine codes that we can't see, interpret anymore by ourselves unless you're really good at assembly. And then, once you have this machine language, you can execute it. So you can bind all of this together, build it into an executable, and that is what is known as software, as an application, basically, that you can then run. 
So you make a program that is at the end, at the very right over there, um, possible to run. For our course, we're going to do things the hard way, and then we'll see that when we are programming, we're going to program in a very basic editor so that you're forced to think about the programming itself, not about having a fancy schwancy IDE that will help you at every point in time. When you're compiling, you're going to execute the compiler by yourself. Later, we're going to see what make files are and other things. But uh, in the beginning, you will execute G++, which is the most widely available C++ compiler available. And you just add that program, you know, this, this uh, text file that is program.cpp in this case, for your compiler, execute it. And the compiler will create, in the end, your application, which you can then run. That is how we're doing things probably a hundred times this semester. <coughs> a program is typically a series of machine instructions, very similar to a recipe. So if you have a recipe, you need to just basically tell people what to do that have never done this before. And that's what you're doing with the machine itself as well. You might have seen this meme video of a father teaching his children how to create a peanut butter jelly sandwich, I think. And they need to make a recipe, and then he is following exactly what they, what they did in the recipe, and it goes horribly wrong many, many times. It's hilarious, you know, search for that um, if you haven't seen it. But it shows you how hard it is to make a recipe that is complete and make, make sure that no one can misunderstand what is written there. And that is exactly why programming is so hard. It's about the recipe, it's about making sure that the data that you're dealing with, you know, the, the, the contents, the ingredients of your recipe, if you will, that those are exactly mentioned as they should be. And then also what you're doing, what you're executing, what those instructions are, should also be exactly mentioned as they should be. Right. What we're going to do when we are uh, programming, we're going to create text files on a computer. So basically, we're going to create text files that are readable. And since this is C++, those text files have usually an, a particular ending, an extension, which is usually cpp or .h. Why? We'll see that later. I'm sure many of you probably already know. And then the pro, uh, a compiler is going to take those files, those text files, and it's going to convert those into a program. Now, if we do all of this, we need an operating system, right? So we need to be able to have an operating system that allows us to create those text files, and we need an application that takes those text files and creates those in an application. And then inside that operating system, we also need to launch that application, right? And this can be very varied. You know, it could take a Windows computer. In that case, it will create somewhere uh, an application which you can double click and then it will execute this application. If you're on a phone, it will be an app, right? An APK, for instance, in Android, which you can e execute. But the simplest or the, the easiest to understand, I think, is still going into uh, a Unix-like operating system where everything is in a terminal. And that's where this course gets really hard. We're asking you to do all your exercises in a terminal on our server. So you log in on our server and you'll see a text window, basically, a command line where you can type commands and execute things one by one. And that is your operating system. That's your operating system where you will have your files, where you will create your text files for particular uh, assignments, and where you can, with particular other commands, execute, for instance, the compiler, or build your, your code into an application. So the good news is then that you don't need anything really on your computer. You just go by a web browser, to our server, and there you get this terminal, basically, that will give you your own space where you can program your software and your solutions to the assignments. The slightly worrying, perhaps, news is that you'll have to get used to this terminal as well. And this is something, perhaps, that is quite new to many of you. This is basically a Linux operating system, um, and it's a command line terminal that you have to operate with as well. That's why we're going to start tomorrow immediately in teaching you how to operate and how to do things in the command line. So not a nice, nice graphical environment. No, you have to type in lots of things. This is the thing they usually show in, in, in movies when a hacker who's really, really good, he's just typing along, right, in this, in this terminal where text is flowing by. And that's what we're going to do. And for that, there is this one um, website 
for which you will get a login in about two and a half hours. And then you can already go to this website and start programming. That's basically the idea. Uh, to get around this terminal, there are several commands that you have to know. There's only um, 15 commands, I think, that you have to know by heart or that you have to look at uh, from the slides um, that will help you in navigating in this operating system. So there's a listing of files, that's ls, to see in a cur you're always in a particular directory and to see which files are in that directory you, or directories as well, you can just type ls and then you will see that list. If you want some more details, like for instance the size or when those files were created, you do ls space minus l. And each time you follow this by pressing enter. So that's the line, you can type whatever you want. Once you think, okay, this command is ready, you type enter and then this is being executed by our server. You can create directories with mkdir, so make directory. And then you can, uh, with a space, you follow then here the name of your directory. So in that case, you can create a new directory. You can go into that directory with cd, change directory, and then you're in this directory. Then you can do ls again, for instance, to see what files are in that directory. If you don't know where you are, sometimes, I mean, when you log in, you're at a particular location and you don't know in which directory you are. In this case, you can do pwd, which is print working directory. And if you want to go to the directory uh, that, uh, that is the parent directory of your current directory, you can do cd space dot dot and dot dot. You probably know this from other operating systems is the previous directory, the parent directory. And then when you start creating text files, you use the nano command. So this is basically an application and the application takes this particular file over here if it exists. If it doesn't exist, it creates this one. And then you can with this uh, file start typing along. And it's basically a text file that you then um, can create source code in. And since it ends with .cpp, Nano knows that this is a C++ file and will already do syntax highlighting, highlighting meaning. It will already make particular keywords in particular columns. All right? It is not that hard. It is actually much easier than learning how to navigate in a WYSIWYG environment like Windows or Mac OS. Right? So that, that's, that's the idea here. So here's a couple of examples. So you basically check what your uh, home directory is or what your directory is, and then you will get, I am in home, and then usually your username will be something like this. So ST for students, 2023 for the year, and then there is this um, code that is usually seven characters long. And there you can then, for instance, create a directory, so for instance, bday, you can see what files are in there, uh, are now in there, and now there is this bday, directory and there's this particular file over here and you will probably see exactly this so in a few hours when you get your access uh, credentials you can already start doing this as well you can go into this directory then you can check what is in there because you just created it there's nothing here right that's that's typical and then you can start creating a file for instance bday.cpp so in the end what you have on our server although this is never graphically as displayed as such, is that you have a home directory. In that home directory, you have your directory. And in your directory, you just create a directory called bday. The capitals are very important. If you had, uh, some t for instance, small d, small a, and small y over here, then this would be a completely different directory name. So there's, you know, whether th some things are capitalized or not is very important. You will see that also during programming. And then you just created this particular file with nano. Right? And this you will be doing exactly like this, probably also 100 times this semester. So if you move on and say, oh, actually, B day is all capitals, I did not want this. I wanted to actually have B day as with a small a and a small y, for instance. But I already programmed everything. What do you do? Well, you can then copy things with the copy command over here. So exactly the same way, we can just see where we are first. We are now in the bday directory under our home directory. So we go to our home directory, to the parent directory. So cd dot dot, we can see what uh, is there. And just like in the previous slide, you know, we have our bday directory and we have this one file that happens to be there. We can create now a second directory called bday. 
and then with the copy command we can copy one file to another file. So we can copy in this case from our current bday directory and then in this directory we have our bday.cpp file and we copy this to our new directory bday with small a and small y and then we don't have to do this usually but we can uh, then just say we want this particular file to be exactly the same name. We could also change this name. In this case, we would have a completely new file here. So the copy command allows us to copy files from a certain point to a certain point. And then if we want to really completely get rid of this old directory, we can do rm, like remove, rf, and then bday, and that it basically just removes the entire old directory, bday with the big A and the big Y. And then we can go into our new directory and then continue programming. This is a typical problem that people tend to have in their exercises. They start with the wrong directory name and then they already solve the entire thing and then now they need to switch. So this is kind of a template of how to do this. And you will learn how to do this. There's only a few commands that you have to really, really learn uh, during this course. And you've just seen most of them, right? So with those commands, that's it. So you had this situation, you had then, you copied from this file to here, and then you removed the old directory, and now we have exactly the same situation again, right? I hope that this is kind of clear. It's essentially this view that you have, but you have it as a text command uh, window on the left. And that's all that is available to you, unfortunately. We don't have a nice WYSIWYG uh, visualization but it allows you to think in the most essential way about your operating system, and I think that is nice. When you're designing programs, therefore, I already told you, we're going to create a text file. And it's creating a text file for you, again, that you will do very, very often, repetitively, means that when you start writing source code, the thing you should automatically start doing is already start mentioning who wrote this code. Typically, it's you, but it could also be somebody else. But it is a very nice way of making sure that afterwards you still know who to talk to when you have a problem with this particular type of code. So authoring the code is very important. Um, you s often can also create a date, but what we want you to do as well is to describe what is being solved in this. So usually you have uh, this blue part at the top, which we call a header, and this header is then showing everyone what this source code is about. And it's at the first lines because that is the most important thing. Every C++ program will also have a function which is called main. What this means, we will see in two weeks, but you will see this main appearing here. Uh, main means the main thing, the, the essential thing of this, of this uh, program. And this main will always return a particular number, and usually this is zero. But the zero doesn't have to be zero, you can also change this number. This is typically the thing that your program gives back to the operating system, and the operating system can use this, for instance, as an error code. Zero means everything is fine. If you put error one, or 100, or 57, you know, this might be a particular meaning that, uh, that the operating system might still have something about as well. So 57 could mean there was a problem with the file system so that the operating system can say, I couldn't launch this application because there was a problem with the file system, right? So essentially your application will have these three things, the header, so that people can still interpret your code quite well from the start, the main function so that it's executable, so that something is being executed, and this return statement so that your code kind of interfaces with the operating system. That is the essential part of a program. If you would have just this, and you would compile this into a program, this would work. Your operating system would then get the zero. You can actually get the zero as well. And if you change the zero to a seven, you can also get the seven as well. Let me quickly show you how this is going to happen during the exercises. So during the exercises, we're going to see something like this. So you're going to get some type of assignment and you're going to get uh, some type of problem that you have to solve. And this is something that you will be doing in a few weeks automatically, hopefully. So we have a certain problem here, and this is called the birthday paradox. Who knows about the birthday paradox already? No one? No? Ah, okay, some people, very good. 
So the birthday paradox is basically, it's called a paradox because it's very unintuitive. But if you have a group of people, like say the first two rows here are about 23 people, a bit more actually, but say there's are 23 people, what is the probability of all the people here in the first two rows that two people at least have exactly the same birthday? You would see that probably the probability is quite low, right? 10%, 20%. Well, actually, statistically speaking, um, or probability uh, like speaking, is actually more than 50%. So it is quite likely that two people here in the first two rows have the same birthday. And that is called the birthday paradox. Now the problem is how do we do this? How do we execute this? How do we visualize this? Well, we need to go and use this as a programming example. We have a problem, we want to solve this. And since a computer can deal with numbers quite well, um, we're going to let a computer solve this for us. Of course, we'll have to think about something first. We'll have to do some, some reasoning, but that's something what we will have to do or that's what we're advised to do here in this exercise. And then important when you get your exercises is to not only just look at the assignment itself, but also make sure that you create these step-by-step -step things and look, for instance, at the exact thing that you'll have to do so because we have a system that in place that will afterwards check, for instance, whether you solved your assignment correctly or not, you'll have to usually start with creating a directory by yourself. In this case, it's the directory 089. Um, and in that directory, you have to create a particular file. In this case, it's bday, where the a and the y are small, .cpp. And this needs to then solve our birthday paradox problem. And here we have to say that the user can input an integer, and then with that integer, it usually has some, some hints on how to solve this, but this is basically how we're going to uh, do things. This is not yet there. This will be several weeks before you will be able to do such a thing, but it's also not too long. So when you go into our server, this is the view that you will get. You will get a window on the left and a window on the right, and in those windows you can type things, like what we just saw, print working directory, and then you can see exactly what you are seeing now. Is this readable from the people in the back? Can you read this or shall I make it bigger? I'll make it slightly bigger still. Okay, more I can't do, unfortunately. But that should do it, right? We're going to start with one window only. I'll just uh, start like this. So we just got uh, uh, the information. We should create a directory. Does anyone still know what it was? EX. 0A9, excellent, thank you. So we created this directory. We can do ls again, and now we can see, or we can do ls, and now we can see that there's a cppin.config file. Don't worry about that, but now there's also our directory. We can change into this directory. If you're typing always, the, the pros, you know, when they start typing and there's only one directory which is, you know, then continuing with 089, you can press tab, and then it will automatically fill in what is, what is, uh, what is the only, po only possible solution. So this would be a very long directory name. You just have to type in the first characters, press tab, and then you can go into this directory. And in this directory, we have nothing. It's completely empty, right, as you can see. And then we have to create our file, which was called bday, and exactly like this, not like this, and with the code, it will be exactly the same. With the code, you'll have to make sure that it is exactly the way the computer likes it to have. Um, and it's a C++ file. So now we're creating this. So now we launched our nano editor, which is also completely text-based. I mean, here you can then create a program, go back and forth, not like in your terminal, and you can also use the mouse. So it's a, a little bit nicer than just having your command line, only a little bit. Right? And what we saw, there's three components that you always have to start with. First, we create a header, and this starts with uh, backslash star and ends with star backslash. That's we'll, why we'll see in a second. And there we'll have to see who is programming it. You can add a date, you can add the description, um, and typically you also add your ID uh, for your exercises. In this case, I have a very 
fictitious ID. Um, and our description is um, solution to the birthday, oops, birthday paradox. There we go. That's what we're going to do. So people later, meaning what is B day again? You can read the first lines, it's there. Second thing, our main function. Our main function is written like this and why we will see in a second. Um, and returns zero. We can also return something else. There's no really must that we have to return zero, but typically zero means everything went fine. And now we're going to solve our birthday paradox. Now we're going to solve it, or in, in the slides in a second, you will see it solved in an object-oriented way. I'm going to take a little shortcut so I don't have to type too much. I'm going to type it in a functional way, or solve it in a functional way. But first we have to see how we're going to solve this birthday paradox, right? And then we have to start thinking. And thinking means that we have to later on explain what we were thinking when solving a certain thing. And it leads to the importance of documenting your codes, meaning you have to always write text in your code that explains why you're doing a certain thing. Now, imagine we have a certain set of people, so all the people in the first two rows, and we want to see what the likelihood is that at least two of those people have the same birthday. Now, we're going into the realms of probability theory. I'm not sure if how many of you have seen probability theory, but it's actually very easy to understand what we're going to do. So first of all, the first trick we're going to use from probability theory is that the probability of something, something, is the same as 1 minus the probability of not that thing. That is very wishy-washy. You know, my maths teacher would definitely not like that type of uh, explanation, but I guess, I guess you get the gist of it. So the likelihood that Angela Merkel will now come in that door is, no, it's not zero. It could happen. Maybe I just invited her and she's coming through the door. But it's very low, right? It's probably 0 0.000001. It's unlikely, but it's not completely impossible. That is our probability of something happening. I will add a little bit here, happening there. Um, but then we can say, what is the probability of not a thing happening? That is probably the opposite of that. It's 99.99999, right? So the likelihood that Angela Merkel is not going to walk through that door in any second now is probably very high. That means 0 0.00001 is the same as 1 minus 99.99999, uh, right? Okay, that, that, uh, that is the, the step one that we're going to do because that makes it easier. We have to then basically say, step two is the, prob the probability that in a group of n people, two have, or at least two, have the same birthday, that is exactly the same as saying this is one minus the probability that in this group of n people, two people don't have the same birthday. And now we can go in another construct that is used in mathematics, we can quickly do the trivial thing. What if you have two people only, right? What is the likelihood that in a group of two people, those have completely different birthdays? Now, the likelihood that one, the, the, the way to visualize this is you take those two people, like those two people here, you take the birthday of this person, and then you say, what is the likelihood that the second person has a different birthday, right? So this person, for instance, has a birthday on the first of, I don't know, but you know, it might be, would be very, very unlikely that I, I would get correct, but I would say the 20th of October. No, sorry, otherwise we would have to sing now. So the 20th of October, this person has a birthday. What is the uh, probability that the second person does not have the 20th of October as a birthday? Any guesses? So you take your year, we assume a normal year with 365 days. One is now already taken. 
And the likelihood that this is not the same birthday means that you can take any of those other days, any of those 364 other days, and the likelihood is then that divided by 365, right? So it's 364 divi divided by 365 for two people. Now if we add a person, we add you to this group over here. So this person has, for instance, the 20th of October, this person has the 1st of January. What is the likelihood that this third person would have a different birthday? So they don't have the same birthday. That would be 360. Three divided by 365, exactly. It's, oops, a typing problem. Now, how do we merge those two together? Well, that is perhaps the, the, the harder part. We multiply these. So we have 364 divided by 365 times 363 divided by 365. That is the likelihood, so the probability, that these three people do not have the same birthday, right? And that way we can add, and I think you will see already that there is this thing happening. We can continue like that. If we add her to the group, we will see 362 divided by 365. And we can continue like that until we go to our n, our group number, right? So that is exactly that that we have to keep on calculating now. So that is our, our solution already as an algorithm, as an approach. All we have to do is solve that as a programming uh, part. Now for that I'm going to create a function first. What that is, you will see later, you might already know, but um, and it's just kind of already visible, I think. But if you don't know this, don't worry, don't panic. I'm trying to show you just what you will be capable of in a few weeks already. So we'll get a function in that case that calculates the probability that out of uh, num people, I basically start already thinking about my variables. You will see in a second what that is. Um, at least two have a same birthday, which is basically solving the birthday paradox or calculating the birthday paradox for us. Now, the first thing we have to know is what a probability can be devised as. It's the data. A probability is usually a number that is called a floating point number. You know, basically something like a percentage, like 99.999. But usually we deal with it exactly as something that is between 0 and 1, right? So it could be 0 0.5 or it could be 0 0.2234 or something like that. And in after today you will know, or after tomorrow you will know, that this is called, uh, or that we usually take a double for that. And why this is called a double, we'll see later as well. And then we need to have a name for our function. I'm going to just call this, uh, this is not a nice name, B the paradox. That is much paradox. That is much nicer. And it will take um, a variable, in this case, this is an integer. What that is, we'll see later as well. And we call this num people. Right. And finally, I can start programming now. This was all setting up the program. Now I can start programming. And the program is basically looking at this, at my solution, and creating codes so that the machine can understand. Now, one of the first things we'll see is that variables play a big role. We'll need a double. I'll call this p for probability, or I'll call it prob, actually. Um, and I'll initialize it to 1 already. And then I need to do repetitively this over here. And afterwards, I need to do 1 minus. So this prob I'm going to return as uh, uh, in my function. So I'm going to do 1 minus prob. And that is basically what I'm going to calculate here. So the only thing that I need to calculate still is this 364 times 363 times 362, each of those divided by 365, right? That is what, what we need to do. And we don't know how big our group is going to be, but we need to know that we need to do this repetitively. In one week, we'll see that is a loop. And we use for that a so-called for loop. And what I'm going to show you now, either you know it already, then it's uh, boring, uh, or you don't know it yet, and then it's not so boring, it's probably overwhelming, but don't worry about it. This is basically what you will be doing in a few weeks anyway. 
So I'm going to start with a, an integer i, which starts at 1. It's going to be smaller than our num people. And I'm going to increment it by 1 each time. And then what we're going to calculate is this, times this, times this, repetitively. And the way to do this is another a very obvious uh, programming construct is I'm going to take, take this prop over, over here that we already defined. It's a piece in our memory. And I'm going to redefine it as the previous value times and then the new thing. And the new thing is this 365 minus i divided by 365. And this is basically exactly our solution over here that we had. So we start with 364 divided by 365, then i is incremented at 363 divided by 365, and so on, until we have the entire group calculated. So for any group of n people, or num people, as a, as a number here, we can now calculate the likelihood that two of them have exactly the same birthday, or at least two of them. That is what this function now calculates for us. And in our main function, we now just have to show this in our terminal. And for that, we have to start including something. And this is why, um, and it's basically in functionality that is not per default there. So if I would not write this line and I would already compile this, everything would work, hopefully, unless I made a mistake. If I now want to add something, and this is something that you will do also a lot, is you need to add some more functionality that is standard for C++. But you need to include it. What that is, we will see later as well. And then we need to first ask the user to give us a number. This will be the, the way to do this. What this means, you will see much later. Uh, we will already deal with this later as well. So basically, we'll have to ask the user to say, um, how big is the group of people, for instance? And then we need to read the number that the user is going to type in. That is done with C in. And for that, we need this operator. Well, that is, we'll see later. And for that, we need to have a variable, which is an integer. And I'll call this n to keep it short. So from now on, uh, we're getting the number that the, the user is typing in, and that is our n. And the next thing that we need to do, I'm just going to copy-paste over here, is... OK, I should... There. The probability that at least two people in this group... OK, I'm getting... have the same birthday is, and then we're going to write b day paradox. We're going to execute our function with our n, and then we're going to do a return. And for that, we need to do st and line. Right. Did I make a mistake anywhere? It is. It is not just likely, it's very likely that I make mistakes during this lecture. You will start spotting mistakes. People, please r call me out when we do this, because you're going to be my, my, my style checker and my uh, spell checker as well. So if I now didn't make a mistake, we have now a fully functioning code, which we can convert into an executable. Let's do that. So to do this, uh, we can use the other pane, actually. So we have our nano over here. Let's see where we are over here. We need to still go to our directory. That's what we just did. And now we have our CPP file. We can ev even see that it's um, when it was written, you know, how big it is. It's 839 bytes long. This is basically almost the same as 839 characters that I typed right now. Um, and you know who it belongs to. So this is basically our text file that we can also read. So I can also here say nano 
B day, and then I have exactly the same again. If I exit, exit is control Q over here, as you can see. So if I uh, press control Q, I go out of nano again. I can launch G++, which is basically our C++ compiler. And I tell G++ compile bday.cpp. And if we then launch that, then either we get errors or we get nothing. We get nothing. And this is good. Because it means, if we look at the directory again, there is now a file called a.out. This is a default file that will basically be our executable. And now to execute a.out, we just have to do dot slash, meaning in this directory, execute a.out. And if we execute it, then we will execute exactly the program that we had. How big is the group of people? Let's do the birthday paradox, 23. You would think a very low probability, but if you then let the computer analyze it, the probability that at least two people in this group have the same birthday is 50.7% or 0 0.507, right? There are, there in this course, I think there's uh, about uh, 80 people. What about 80 people? 99.9914%. So amongst all of you, there are at least two people that have, well, it's very likely there are at least two people that have the same birthday, right? Observe what I did. I didn't go into an IDE that let me complete all the things I was typing. I was not constantly compiling and checking whether it already works. And I was doing a lot of thinking, not a lot of copying, code from other websites, or asking ChatGPT, what is the birthday paradox solution? I, I was able and capable to do this myself. Now, homework for all of you, ask ChatGPT, or a, sim a similar large language model, to do this. And you will, you will see that you will get a solution. The solution will be different from this one. And try to understand the solution. Uh, and do it in your program language or C++, you will see that there's quite a lot of differences and quite a lot of hurdles if you want to base your solution on something that already exists. And this is one of the pains of programming anyway. As a programmer, you often have to use libraries or code by others. And typically, you have to really understand this code quite well as well in order to write code that is fully functional and doesn't have many, too many mistakes. Right? That, that, that is really, really hard. So make sure, and that's why I find it so important to tell you this again and again and again, do the coding yourself, do the coding the hard way first, and you will see that although it is a bit painful at the beginning, you will learn how to do this. And just like learning how to speak a language actively is a lot of work and means a lot of practice, writing uh, in, pro in a program language something is exactly the same. And it only is fun when you really understand what you're doing. It's not fun when you copy paste some codes from Stack Overflow or ChatGPT or some other website that you found, which happens to work, but a bit later you, you find that there is still something wrong with that. And you don't know why, because now you have 200 lines of code that you didn't really write yourself and don't really understand. Right? That, that is the, the danger, I think, in programming in the long term. Sure, you can get something uh, working quickly, but you don't really get it. And that is not fun. Right? That is the idea here. Okay. The other thing that I wanted to say is clear, command clears your window. Um, while you're doing your exercises, you can also then check how well your code works. And we're going to do, uh, so you can just type check. And then you will get for your code, whether it compiles, whether it works, whether it was your own work, because we're plagiarism checking, whether your header was correct, et cetera, et cetera. But you will also see the CPP lint here. Does anyone know CPP lint already? No? CPP lint is a tool that Google uses to make sure that everyone inside Google is writing the same type of code. And that's what we're doing as well. We're, I mean, basically, if you can program for Google, you can program for us. So basically, and many companies have taken this. 
So it's checking your text file and making sure that what, you've, what you're doing here is exactly the way you should do it. And I'm going to just guess what uh, cpplint is complaining about. It is about this. There should be a space here, and there should be a space here. And I think by now my, and I might have also a problem with this here. This might be too long. So now I think it is going to be Google compliant. Let's see. Ah, no, I made even more errors. What is there going on? You can do this later. You will see this. cpplint is the, is the command. And then you just supply your um, bday.cpp file. And I can see why. So there's line 15 ends in a white space and line 17 has an extra space after, oh, what is this? So you can go to the line. So line 15 over here has a space at the end. Exactly, that is this green thing over here. We remove that. Line 17, um, is there, there's an extra space in the function call that shouldn't be. Okay, that I didn't know. So now it should be compliant. Yeah, so if I do check, then this is perfect. Everything is green, and I can expect that the grade I'm getting for this exercise is the maximum. The only thing that we're checking on top of that is, of course, certain assignment-specific things that an automatic checker like check can't do. So it's not a complete reassurance that we will have the full points, but something close to it. Another thing that you might have not seen is that I do indent everything. So I have these two spaces here, right? I have these two spaces here. And then as soon as I stop with the for loop here, I go back again. That makes sure that the program code that I'm writing with this indentation is easy to read. And you will see later that as you program on, this becomes easier to do, you will do this automatically, but it comes also easier to read. So that all of you who are producing codes, that code will look exactly the same. It will be indented with two spaces, and it is CPP lint conform as well. And it makes our life a lot easier. We don't see loads of different styles. It is similar to how to write, you know, people need to write neatly, otherwise people that are correcting those people would have a very hard time in, in reading this code. Right, so, and as I said, this is common practice in most companies. Like if you go to a big co company like Google, then they ask you to do CPP lint conform programming, meaning what you're typing needs to be exactly like what I uh, produced over there. And it's better to, while you're typing, already get used to this, right? So that's why we're doing this. It's an extra hurdle. It's going to be a pain in the beginning, but at the end, your code will look so much nicer. Okay? All right, so let's go back to the slides. Because as I said, you know, we now and then also see some slides. We don't just do the programming. If you want to do the same extra uh, type of programming, but then for instance as a class, then it will look something like this. And I don't expect any of you to have really followed exactly what I was doing. I was just showing you a preview of what you should be doing by the end of the semester. You should be able to take a problem, solve it, program it, and then program it in the perfect possible way, right? That is what you're going to do now in um, a few months. And you're going to learn to do this in the next couple of weeks, week by week by week. And what all of those things mean, we're going to see, of course, in the slides. It's something that you can refer to. But again, the best way of teaching you how to do this is by, by making you pro do the programming itself. So what we've seen is that when you compile something is that in the text window or in the, in the terminal, you launch G++ or you say G++ is the command and you add then your file name to that and then press enter as I did over there where I did not have any feedback. That means there are no errors. Everything went fine. And then as I said, it creates an a.out application and I can launch this application to then see what type of program I just created. I don't, I can also say with a minus O in this uh, for G++, I can create my own name of application. If you do this 
uh, minus O and then B day, for instance, then the file that I will create, the application I will create, is not A.out. It will be B day in this case, right, which is nicer. Somebody once did exactly the same for G++. They basically said, we compile a program and we call it now G++. Exactly like this, we compile a program and we call it now B day. And from then on, people can execute our program to then see what the birthday paradox is about, all right? What you see already is that there's a main function, and that in this main function, we typically fill this with lots of pieces of code, and this piece of code is kind of the recipe for our compiler to see, and then for our computer in the end as well, to see what needs to be executed at which time and how often. So that is, that is what really uh, is the most important. Later we will see that we can also add multiple files because we're going to create a larger projects with multiple files and you can put all of those to the GPP G++ compiler and then one entire file will be compiled. Sometimes you need to just compile something and not into an executable but into an object file we'll call it later. And then you will see that there's a .o file being created that you can't execute. But later you can glue together with your program and then it suddenly works. Much later this will become clear. But this is basically how C G++ works, which uh, is the only, there's so many more things you could do with this, but in this course, this is all you need to know. You will see later that there is also ways to include libraries. Most of the libraries we're going to see um, are libraries that we just, like we just did now, where you just include something with a particular library name, and then suddenly you have this std, colon, colon, c out, or std, colon, colon, end line, or c in, as we just saw. Those are things that you wouldn't have available if you would not include this IO stream here. Also, much later, we will finally understand what those things are. Are those variables? Are those operators? We don't know yet. That is something that we'll just also again learn by doing. And then much later we'll see that some other libraries need to be linked uh, with our C++. And uh, we will do this with this minus L over here. You can try this out because basically we're going to do, use the N curses also a lot. N curses is a little bit more graphical. It basically allows us to use color in our terminal window and to go up and down and to create pictures or games into our terminal. Uh, all text-based, so pretty rough still, but it will be a lot more fun than the typical C in, C out, mundane uh, functionality that we had in the previous slides. So that is something we will we'll start doing as well. As I said, and I can't repeat this often enough, indent your codes. If you don't do it, and you're in your assignments, all of those yellow diamonds would be empty. So you would start the line here with int over here, and if would start over here, and for would start over here, you would lose points. And I think uh, this might sound harsh, because the program works, but the program is not nice to read, and it's, it's not compliant with many of the styles that uh, uh, should be there. And obviously, what people then often reply to me is, yes, but in an IDE, like Visual Studio, this is done automatically for me. Well, this may be, but it's usually completely different from one IDE to the other. And if you then take codes and import it from one to the other, you typically have completely other things happening. Also, that is, I mean, it's much nicer if people are already aware of this when they, when they are coding. All right, so basically make sure that the coding has this two-space indentation. <clears throat> For now, you don't really know why or when you need to do this indentation. You will see this again through examples in our, in our uh, course. All right, so let's now go into the basic components of a program and we'll do this really quickly. All these different colors that our uh, nano program has, uh, but also that we show into the course, have a meaning. It means that there are different components that are there. And what C++ does when it takes your text file and it converts this into an application is it will start reading your file from the top left and going to the right. And then line by line, it is parsing your codes. 
And this parsing means it starts looking for words it already knows or characters it already knows. And that means there, there are certain things that our parser needs to know. And it's kind of like with language. You know, you have a vocabulary and exactly like that you can make up words as well. I can just now say that from now on that thing over there is a desk projector or we call it something completely different, a bloomidoo. And from now on, we all know that that is a bloomidoo over there, right? So that is exactly the same. I can create language or can extend language as we go on, but there is also basics of a language that already exists. And that's exactly what our C++ programming will be like, uh, like as well. In our programming ex uh, class this semester, we will only use these keywords for learning C++. And I would argue that this is the essence of C++. If you know this, then you know C++ by heart. And the most important things. There are about two times more keywords that you could learn in C++. Some of you might have already seen C and C++. So you might, have, you might in this case, if you would look for it, miss, uh, for instance, unsigned or signed as keywords. Right? Or long. But that is not the essence of C++. So I'm leaving those away. And I'm expecting you not to use those because that is not really essential anymore. The essence is those few keywords you have to know and you have an entire semester now to learn those keywords and what they mean, in which context you should use those. It's not that many. Um, so I hope uh, that I know that uh, at least a third of you already have seen C. In this case, I hope that you can forget about all of these other keywords because I expect you to learn these and these only, but, all, but know these really, really well, okay? <clears throat> so that is one thing. So there's these keywords that have a particular meaning. There are preprocessor directives which start with this uh, pound sign or hash uh, sign. And we'll, we've already seen includes. The other thing we'll see much later is header guards. And that's it, that's the only a time where we'll see um, these um, this preprocessor directives. No other thing. So if you include a library with uh, the smaller than sign and a bigger than sign as compounds, uh, like n curses over here, then it's a standard library and the compiler already knows in which directory it has to search for the source codes or the object codes of this particular library. If you have this over here, the quotation marks, the double quotation marks, that means we're looking in the current directory. So this is typically code that you write, this is typically code that others have written, and it is somewhere in another directory in your file system, on your operating system. That's all there is to it. <coughs> then you can also invent names for yourselves, for functions, for variables, like this numpeople I just did, or this, uh, B-Day paradox function that I had. I could have called this anything I would have liked. Typically, you can call things uh, in many, many ways. There's almost no requirement in the size. You can make extremely long uh, names, but then, of course, your code would be very hard to read, typically. So there is this thing that you have to juggle between. You have to keep your names short and easy to interpret but not too short, like n, for instance, what I did there in the, in the main function was kind of wrong. You know, basically, then I would have um, had to add, for instance, a comment saying n is the number of people in the group, for instance. So it's kind of an art choosing the right names for the things you're going to create in your program. And there are certain limitations. So um, the names need to be unique. So if there's already a name taken, like one of the keywords, like int or double, as we saw, are keywords. They have a particular meaning that is already there. So you can't crea create a function that is called double. Or you can't create an, uh, a variable that is called int. So th that you have to know. That's why you need to know the keywords. And then your names can only contain letters, digits, and underscores. Nothing else. And it can't start with a digit. So it needs to start with either a letter or an underscore, right? So that it means all of those are things you can do. So you basically capitals or um, lowercase, it doesn't matter. You can basically do a lot of um, creating your own names. 
But those are wrong. This one is wrong because it has an empty space. This one is wrong because it has this minus sign. Other programming languages actually do allow these type of things. There are some, no, most actually don't. Um, here it starts with a digit, wrong. So that's there, the compiler will then complain. And while is already a C++ keyword, so you can't you know, create a variable which the, with, the, with the name while, okay? So that will be also a, a important part of you programming. You'll need to create things and give them a name. And these are the limitations when naming those things. Then there are constants. Constants are everything that is not changing. For instance, um, whenever I said, or in the beginning I said, for instance, that this probability is initialized as 1.0 in our program. This 1.0 is a constant. It's an element in our recipe that is not changing anymore. It's constant. And this can be an integer, so basically I could just have 15. Or it could be a floating point. In this case, it is ended with a small f. And it usually has uh, dots and then digits after the dots. Or it could be a double, like um, a floating point number, like a probability, the thing that we just had. Later we'll see that there's also characters. Those have the single quote quotes around it. It's for one particular symbol, basically. There's a string with this double quotes that we already used just now in the, po in the birthday paradox, right, when I was writing out in the terminal what is the number of people, right? That was between these double quotes. That means everything that is between those double quotes is what we see later, a string, but it's a constant string. It's something that is part of our program, but that cannot be changed anymore. And later we'll see also there is another thing called a Boolean, which is either true or false. So that is everything that we have in terms of constants. And by just looking at them, you can see what type they have. And that's coming, I'm already, that's a precursor to the come of some of the next uh, slides already. Then there's operators like plus, like minus, like star for times or backslash for division and so on. There are loads of operators that we will see as well. Braces are there and separators are there, including like a space or taps could be also ones or an enter, like a new line. All of those are characters in our text file that have a particular meaning. There are comments, right? And the comments, I already, I hope you saw this. Um, sometimes a comment has two slashes and is just for that line. Sometimes I want to make a multi-line comment. In that case, I start with slash star. And then everything that follows until I have the star slash is then my comments. So I can then span multiple lines. At the end of the line over here, it will go back to normal codes. It will say that the next line is not a comment anymore, right? And the comments are not regarded. So the first thing G++ does when it reads our text file, our C++ text file, is it will throw away all those comments, right? C++ is not interested in our comments. We are interested in our comments, and people that read our code are interested in our comments, okay? Now, important, and also this is something you need to learn. Comments should explain your code, but never be trivial. That means the bad uh, uh, thing is if you start a floating point, this is coming as well, but anyway, and we call it aspect ratio, everything is fine until here. But if we then comment, this variable holds the aspect ratio, that is completely trivial. You don't need to know that, right? This is something that you could have known already at this point over here. So this comment is not necessary. However, if we have a, a name that we created ourselves called screw max width, then we don't really know whether max is a person here or a, a short for maximum. And screw could be many things, but it could be also screen. So in that case, the comment maximum screen width is actually nice to have, right? So there is this balance that you have to learn in creating names that are short and descriptive enough and also commenting your code so that others later, and you yourself in a few weeks, can still read this code. Okay, that's, you will see a big part of it. Also, this will be graded upon. If you produce code without any comments, also that will typically lead to minus points. All right, so we, don't worry. When you come here to the sessions, we will show you things. We will look at your code. In the beginning, we will be very lenient, but we will say, 
that should be you know, this way, all right? So we will have an example here, and this particular example you can also try out later in, on our server. Um, and for that example, we have loads of different types of things that our parser then uh, uses. So it throws away everything that's blue, and then starts reading from the top to the bottom, left to right, and then interpreting what you try to say there to then map all of that into machine code that we can execute. Now the thing that I wanted to see today still, and that I'm going to see in a very diminished way, so there's lots more in C++. However, if you can do this, you can do 99.999% of C++ anyway. Everything else is just reading a little bit more about uh, peculiarities. Is that we look at only the most important variables. So a variable, and that's also something that I think is not explained very well in most programming courses, is a piece of memory on your computer. And the nice thing about C++ is that you have full control on this memory. There are certain programming languages where this is done very wishy-washy, where people never really get a view on this. In C++, you're forced to have a look at this. So if you create, or if you have your program, typically you create data, and this data is typically thought of as a piece in memory uh, with a particular meaning. And this is then your variable. So it's a memory space that can hold a value, and this value can be anything, we will see in a second. And this value can be changed afterwards, if this is a true variable. So for instance, we can declare a variable in this case, and we do this by saying, first, what type of variable this is. That's what is in green here. It stands for int, which is standing for integer, like a whole number. And we call it in a particular name, key press counter, for instance. And then when we create this variable, we will see that it's typically a good idea to already initialize this as well. We can say that the value initially, when we create this variable, is zero. And then we can comment to make sure that people know what, why this variable is there. And then later in our code, we can take exactly this name again and use it as a variable in the mathematical way, right? So in math, you basically have also um, 4x being an element of this particular set, like the set of real numbers, for instance, do, and then we basically can have x then vary in a particular way. Exactly here, it's the same thing. So key, key press counter is a variable. We can change that value at will, and we can also check, read that value. We can say, what is the value of key press counter? If it is bigger than 27, if that is the case, then we do a particular thing. For instance, we give key press counter a new value, namely zero, right? So variables are a way of, making, of giving a name to something in memory, and then in memory being able to get a value that we can change or that we can check, those two things. Important, however, is also that variables always live in a certain scope. If you're in your main function and you create a variable there, like our integer n I had just a few moments ago, then after I finish this function, our integer n is taken away from memory, this memory is erased, and this variable is gone forever, right? So variables live for only a particular time, and the typical way to see is that this is a scope. And this is typically in a function, for instance. If you're in a function, this is how we'll see this in the beginning, then for this function, this variable will be alive, and as this function ends, this variable will be gone. That will become very important later. And then there are some variables that we can define to be constants, like the constants we saw on the, on the previous slides, and we do this by adding const in front of them. So if we say we have a variable which is 42, and later we'll have to use this 42 everywhere, then it's usually good programming practice to say in the beginning, there is this thing that we call answer, and it has the variable 42, but this is never going to be changed. And in the rest of my program, every time I have answer, I know that this is 42, really, okay? Again, we will see this through practice, 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 why this makes sense. That is the first part that you have to know about variables. They're memory spaces. The second part is that these memory spaces 
have an interpretation. And that's what we call a type. So th there are only those types that we will see in this course. And with those types, you will have everything that you will need to know about C++. The rest you can expand from there all by yourself. So we have integers, those are whole numbers, like minus 28 or 122. There's a floating number type as well, to have like a floating number. But there's also a double, and it's called double because it's taking twice as much space in memory as a floating point. That's the reason why it's called a double. But float and double are basically uh, numbers which have added precision. So they have a dot and a digit behind the dot. So they can represent, for instance, a probability, like we just did in the birthday paradox. There are characters, those are symbols. And when we have, for instance, um, input and output to our terminal, our strings are nothing more than loads of characters in a sequence, right? So when we added uh, uh, letters and digits and a question mark, then each and one of those is a character. And we have booleans, so be for boolean. So basically it's either true or false. And those two we can use and also as constants in our program. So when we define a variable, we need to start first thinking about what is the type of our variable? What could our variable be? Could it be an integer? Could it be a character? Could it be a boolean? Could it be a float or a double? And that's all we have to do in this course. There are others, you will see um, later on that there's lots of other standard ones as well. But if you understand these, you'll understand the, the essence of C++. And then the type is important not just for variables, but also for constants. As I showed here with the constants uh, examples, by just looking at, it, at these different examples, you can see what type these constants have. Um, this is a floating point because of the small f. If it wouldn't have this, then it would be a double. This over here is a character because it has the single quotation marks. True is a keyword and it stands for a constant Boolean value. 15 is a whole number, so it's an integer, right? So by looking at those constants, you know already that those have a particular interpretation. And that is basically what a data type means. To show you this, and this is the most important example of today for solving the, sol uh, solving the, uh, the assignment of tomorrow, so make sure you stay awake for a few more minutes. And I know I'm going fast, and I know that this is very tedious sometimes, but the first weeks are the harder ones. Then you will see through repetition that you will start having these aha moments, where you also start seeing structure and sense making. So here is an example of a program where we just create variables and we give them a new value. So that's what's happening here. You can copy paste this into, an, into the Nanot editor, you can run this, it won't show you anything because there's no C out or C in happening there, but you will see that this compiles and it can be run as, a, as an example. What will ha be happening behind the screens, and you can also visualize this later, we'll see this, is it will go line by line and it will create in memory spaces for all those variables. So again, as I said, C++ will start reading it will come to this int main and say, aha, this is where our executable starts. What follows now is our step-by-step -step instructions of what to do. On this line over here, it will have to store a character and name this my symbol. So what is happening in memory is, somewhere in memory, we reserve some memory space. We call this memory space my symbol, and we memorize that this is a character. Under the hood, you will have, and this is something that you might know as well, in computer science, everything is binary. So we have bits here, and a character is eight bits long. So these eight bits over here are kind of the symbol, or a representation of the symbol that I want to have. And typically when I initialize something, a variable, what happens then? Is it set to zero? Oh, you're not sure? That's very good. No, not necessarily. It depends on your compiler. Some compilers set these things to zero, so now everything is set to zero. All those bits are set to zero. So the number that this represents is zero. However, it doesn't have to be. Sometimes 
compilers can be very lazy and they just reserve the memory in space or the space in memory, sorry. And they might have already some data from a previous function or a previous program that was running there. So it could be that some of those bits are one. It could be that some of those bits are zero. So we don't really know what the value of my symbol is after this first line. That is the, the correct answer, typically. Most compilers, of course, set this to zero, but not all of them, right? Right, so it goes to the next line, and it says, ah, I have to create an integer. I call this my integer. And the compiler knows an integer is four bytes, or 32 bits long in memory. And also that does not have to be all zeros. All those zeros together mean that the integer, our number, is a zero. But that's an interpretation, right? So that, that, is, that is something that uh, is not necessarily there. But basically, my integer at the moment has a particular value, but also a particular space in memory. Then a Boolean. My Boolean is created. It's a Boolean. And in memory, a Boolean is 8 bits. This is odd, perhaps. Why would a Boolean be 8 bits? Because a Boolean can only have two values, true or false. And it's the same in C++ as 1 or 0. So why would we waste 8 1s or zeros to that? Well, that has a particular background that in um, most architectures you work with at least a byte. And accessing one particular bit is unusually a little bit more work. So that's why a Boolean is formed into one byte. And this is just for those that are interested. Basically, if all of those are zero, then the Boolean is false. If one of those is one, or multiple of those are one, then it's true. Right? So zero is false, and anything that is not zero is true for that Boolean. But again, it's an interpretation thing. And for the last one, my float, it's exactly the same. So a floating point in C++, or a float, floating point in C++, takes up four bytes, and also those don't have to be all zero. A good compiler will create, uh, put, zero, put them to zero, but it doesn't have to be. So now we created those variables and we can play with them later on in our program. For instance, we can give them one after the other new val uh, values. So our integer, we give now the value 12. What happens then is in memory, some of those bits over here will be flipped so that this entire number is interpret interpreted as an integer and interpreted as a 12. 1100 zero, zero at the end. So this is basically a long line of zeros. So 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0000 0
Um, and then the Boolean, when we set it to true, we set typically the last 0, 2, or 1. And now this Boolean is true, not false anymore. All right? So that is what's happening. When you create a variable, you reserve memory space, and when you change that value of that variable, it will automatically have a consequence in memory on the lowest binary level. And the reason why we need types for that is because C++ needs to interpret this data as a particular type, right? And that is the essence of things. So there are only a few basic types that you have to know. Again, those are the ones. And here are kind of the limitations. Since an integer is stored in 32 bits only, or 4 bytes only, it can only hold so many numbers. You can start counting from 0, 2, and so on. And then you will see that at the one point, you will hit a limit. And the limit for a normal integer is that the lowest number it can represent is minus 2 billion? Billion, I think it is. And the highest one is, again, 2 billion, a bit more, but anyway. And it means that if you want to, for instance, represent the world population, even though this is typically an integer, it's a whole number, there are no half people, right? So you would say this is an integer. You can't represent this as an integer because an integer can only hold to 2 point something billion. Not, how many are we at the moment? 8 billion, I think, right? So th this is a problem. You can't, although this makes sense that an integer is a whole number and that the world population would then be an integer, no, can't do, because an integer is only holding four bytes. A floating point is again stored in four bytes, but the maximum for a floating point is much higher. Uh, it, the lowest one is minus three and a half, more or less, times 10 to the power 38. So that's 38 zeros after the, after the minus 3.4. Uh, no, it's actually 37 zeros after the minus 3.4 in that case. And the same for the positive number. Meaning the world population can be held in a floating point. That is a possibility. Sometimes you're dealing with numbers that are even bigger or if it's a floating point where you need a little bit more resolution, more di digits behind the dots, right? In that case, we use a double. And meanwhile, a double, which is stored in eight bytes, not four bytes, is so cheap. You know, my watch has uh, hundreds of kilobytes in terms of RAM. That means also there, it doesn't make sense anymore to use floats. We can use doubles everywhere, typically. And that's what people tend to do. Unless perhaps they want to save memory for larger constructs. We'll see more about that later. But a double is, all, is stored in eight bytes and can hold even larger numbers or even more precise numbers in the terms of precision. Character, as we saw, stored in one byte. A boolean is also stored in one byte. And a character, here's the link if you want to see. So a character is nothing more than a number um, which is only can only be held in one byte. That means you can have a number going from, typically this is unsigned, so it goes from 0 to 255. That's the maximum range of one byte. And this is then linked or indexed in a table. And in every character that you have, a question mark has then, for instance, value 90. Or uh, a, a, an exclamation mark has a 91, for instance. Or an ampersand has uh, value 128, and so on, and so on, and so on, right? So that's, that's basically the essence of a character. And then we have uh, constants, and from the constants, as I already said, you can see what type they have. If, they if a small f is following uh, um, a floating point, then this is a float. If it's not, then it's a double. That's something that you probably have to then learn by heart. But then these are integers that you can see immediately. That is a character that you can see as well. And those two are Booleans. That also makes sense, right? And those are the basic components that you have to use in programming. With those, you can create vectors, matrices, video files, um, 3D environments, Twitter posts, everything, right? This is basically it. Um, here, quickly, another example that I want to finish with. 
floats uh, are four bytes, doubles are eight bytes. You can see here that the float has a particular value and the double has a particular value after this, these lines are held over here. That's important to know as well. Bec because of that, a, a floating point has, can only hold so many values and a double floating point can hold many more values. That is kind of the explanation why there is this difference, okay? Right, and with this I'm going to stop, or I have to stop, it's time. Um, tomorrow at 8.30 we're going to see each other again. I'm going to show a few more slides so I make my uh, contract for the week. Uh, make sure you look at this, make sure you're prepared, and also expect from me an email to each of you if you're registered in Unizono so that you can already start preparing for doing the exercise on our server. All right? Thank you very much for your attention, and we'll see each other tomorrow.